Hi, just playing a little bit, and you know when you're playing and it doesn't feel bad, it feels like things are lined up, just kind of go through your default system that you've practiced, and you don't have to think about it too much, right? Probably still have an ear for intonation, and is it clear, and all, you know, a lot of foundational aspects, first overlay things. But if things aren't going that well, what do we do? Well, we might seek advice from someone who might know. And they might have a certain paradigm with certain exercises in it that might be useful for you, right? And then maybe you find that those exercises give out after a while. So you have to try to find something. Maybe you go to someone else and they have a paradigm and then they give you some exercises or point out something maybe the other person didn't or said it in another way that makes sense to you and all of a sudden, you know, you put it together and it works for, maybe it just works or maybe again, it has a short span. Now, I've been told, people always say, the most creative person I've ever met, especially, you know, in the realms of playing and things and certain aspects of music and other things, but, and they say, oh, how do you, you're so creative. And so I started to think when people say that, what that means. It's kind of a big topic, actually, because I looked it up in the dictionary, what creative means. And they say, you know, someone who can come up with new ideas or new ways of looking at something. Um, and it gets more complex from there. But there's something about the word new that kept coming up. Um, different creative ways of looking at a situation, maybe to get yourself out of a jam. Which I can tell you, in certain ways, I agree with because I was thinking that creativity is natural, okay? And at the same time, how much in us could block that? Um, and why would that even want to be blocked? But sometimes so many things happen to us, we don't know that it's happening. If we're not accustomed to look, or accustomed, yeah, to looking at things from another angle, except from what we've been told since birth, okay? Um, that could be very difficult after a while to even want to look at anything new or even entertain the idea that there's other ways of approach. So in a certain kind of way, this brings us to the point of where our alignment is. In other words, what are we governed by? Have we decided it? what we want to be governed by? Or um, are we just going by our conditioning and our immediate influences from the environments we find ourselves in? I think this is an important question because if you're not used to looking at anything differently, um, how do you expect to be creative? What are you creating? <laughs> What's being created? 
Well, it's an interesting topic because a human being is always creating something. You let you exhale carbon dioxide and the plants say, yippee, thank you. You know, you're creating some of that for them. Even if it's just a byproduct, a release, something you're not going to use anymore. It's expendable for you in a sense. Not all carbon dioxide is, but when you're getting it out, it goes to the plants, they say thank you. They let off some oxygen. You say thank you. <laughs> Um, so everything gives off something, but we just don't give off oxygen or carbon dioxide. What we actually process inside of ourselves radiates out from ourselves, whether we're speaking or not. Human beings are very radiant beings, okay, that ooze what they process. And some people very outwardly ooze what they process, right? But even someone who seems quiet, they're radiating, even at the level of their energy field. You can walk into a nice place and there's an atmosphere created in that place. And you walk in and go, ooh, what's going on here? This isn't for me, like apartment hunting and stuff like that. You know, you're looking for a new place and walk into one place, eh, no. <laughs> and who knows, a smell could be hitting you in your face. You go, something's wrong. <laughs> but something even not that tactile is a smell, just something doesn't feel right. And that's energetic. And it can get into your instinct. It can start to tighten up your throat. All sorts of things. Other place you walk and go, oh, I can breathe, I feel relaxed, I feel good in here. Something feels welcoming to you. So, people create spaces all the time. In where they live, their cars, So, my point is, there's levels of creating. But when we're talking about really creating, people really think new. So, if, the, if there is a conventional way of going on, and you say, perfect, that forms that little proverbial box and maybe you won't want to look at things differently. But going back to what we're governed by, for example, my life, I really want to know truth. I want to know truth, and I want it to take me where it needs to take me. So looking at it from that perspective, you're not going to totally be like, well, that's it and that's not it, unless you're getting very, very finely tuned. And then you still have a window of open possibilities because what if you got that thing that you really wanted and you're putting an, a concept on it that isn't it? Then is that true to that thing? Or... Can it be true you're just looking at it from a certain angle and you don't think other angles exist? So one of the things is having a greater awareness of different things around you. So since I've been working with people for, you know, 56 or more years now, you know, I know there's different parts to a person. <laughs> different angles, okay, to look at. But also creativity is born out of need. Just like technique. Technique, technology is born out of need. 
and someone gets the idea of something and someone has something else and they come together and another something's made and looking at all this stuff being created. The relationship between created, creative, creation. So I've talked about this in different ways before. But something came to me with my plan. Um, like I was saying, if everything's going well, well, great. <laughs> if it ain't, what are you going to do about it? And then we talked about the different teachers, and this one has these exercises. What if they wear out? You go to another one. Go, you know, on the internet, and you're searching for, what if I have a this and a that? What do I do for this and that? And there's a lot of great ideas. Sometimes you have to give a couple, a bit of time in order to see the results. Well, that's a problem. People think, well, I'll just go to the next one, I'll just go to the next one, I'll just go to the next one. Sometimes going through that variety too quickly, you might not be giving some things a chance. You have to work with things a while to understand them or be with them as they manifest in different people like I have for a while to say, oh, wait a minute, and start connecting the dots. Which brings me up to what I wanted to talk about in a discovery for myself. I have something called Bolter Embouchure Anatomy. And... Um, I've done some master classes on it and we'll talk about it and I'm not going to go through the whole my whole anatomy because you won't see it in Gray's anatomy that's for sure that's why it's Bolter's anatomy <laughs> embouchure anatomy and sometimes with going on an age or not even age just different things in life will affect our support systems our embouchure and of course what's probably really happening it's systemically affecting us, depending on the situation. It could be intense enough that it's going to show up in places that we use really regularly, like as a trombonist, our support system, our arm, our tongue, our whole embouchure structure. Sometimes the hesitancy in the tongue is really, it's caused by something maybe that's getting to be a little bit fearful of coming in because of a mistake that happens once and one doesn't want to go through that again. So, I never used to have any kind of shake or anything like that. Then, I mean, sometimes I would have where my wrists will get shaky. That's not a simple subject, but it's there, and there's different ways I try to control it. Sometimes it's too difficult, and it, and it doesn't. But it's okay. I've accepted that that's part of it, and it's not going to stop me from playing a bit. It's just not. In fact, I'll look at it and try to find other ways. How much do we want to find other ways that break our conventional thinking of how things should be? How often do we do that? If there's a need to do it. And since I work with a lot of people, there's a lot of different things I need to think about because not everyone's the same. And that's what things proven to me. Not all paradigms work for everyone. So, once in a while in a certain range, I'll feel my lip go into involuntary quiver. And I used to, when I was much, much younger, maybe, you know, 50 years ago, um, 49, 48, when I first came to Boston, I'd notice with sometimes older players that sometimes they'd be getting a, like an involuntary quiver. I'd go, whoa, wait a minute. And I kept thinking about it. And then once in a while, I'd feel something in mind later on in years. And I came up with different techniques. And the principle of it is you take something voluntary and overlay it consciously into the area that's involuntarily moving. So sometimes when there was a certain instability in the embouchure, if I 
put a very subtle jaw vibrato, it would go away. Very subtle. You can get it so subtle, hardly anyone can hear it. So that's taking something voluntary, okay? Puts you in control of something that just wants to wobble. You say, hey, well, don't try to freeze it. It'll shake even more. You put your own vibration in it. And that's what the jaw vibrato did, okay? Sometimes that wasn't working as well. Several years later after that discovery, so I had to go, okay, that's not working anymore. There's more. If there's a will, there's a way, and another way, and another way. So you get the principle of what I'm talking about. This is very different than saying, well, do this, and do this, and do this, and do this. Fine, keep doing that. Know that the list can go on forever. And that's fine. That's being a friend of infinity. There's many, so many different ways that things can help you. The thought, the moving towards something that'll help remedy a situation, improve a situation, advance a situation, but of course then make it worse. So there might be something that's going on inside of a person, outside or inside, that's making other, you know, things that used to work not work so well. And either other remedies you have it for it and something's changing, you need to change the remedy. That's the principle. It's important to get the core, the essence, the principles of what's being talked about and make it your own. So I was playing in a certain range that Saint Saw's third range and I was like, oh, what is going on here? And I could feel this wobbling. And sometimes later at night, um, it gets worse for me, okay? Probably my body's starting to get fatigued. And when I get fatigued, there's a systemic physical fatigue. So, and it affects my lip. So, I'm fine with it going, this is, something's going on. Now there's something between the corners, okay? When the grip, um, of the corners from here an imaginary line to like where the mouthpiece sits or even a little past that I call the foundational ridge it goes down across like that and I said okay I'm going to firm up the foundational ridge and I firmed up the whole thing it didn't really help in fact yeah, it did. It froze everything and the sound went like this and almost got very murky. Okay, that doesn't bother me. So I'm saying, okay, what can I learn from that sound and then apply it, but in a lesser amount. That sometimes can work. It wasn't totally working. So, okay. So all these different things were coming to me. I know, wait a minute. Where exactly is that quiver happening? And if you can't find something right away, you look in the area. Okay, foundational ridge from here to here. And then maybe I would have found out it's not the foundational ridge that's being affected by what's causing me to um, sh quiver. So then I went, wait a minute. I think it feels more like right here. And so I still went along the foundational ridge and found a point. So this was a line, foundational ridge line, but I found a point in that line, in the foundational ridge. And I took that point and I made a little imaginary line going right up to my middle of my bottom lip. Kind of, it kind of subtly tucked it in microscopically. When we're dealing with the embouchure, we're dealing in very small increments. And that seemed to help. That seemed to help.
too bad. I could still feel a little something in there. But it definitely felt like, oh man. So this is where sometimes adding, a, even and then I added a little helping of mouthpiece pressure. Very, not a lot, because I don't use that much. And that was the amount. Now, if this is sounding creative, okay, remember there's a principle. Seek and ye shall find is the essence of it. Don't be stuck to what you think an embouchure should be, shouldn't be, any conventional thoughts about it. So you're free of that to discover. And so it was much better, and I've been using it more, and it helps. For that, it doesn't have to be there all the time for everything. But I can see where there'd be other instances that it might make, my flexibility is pretty good. But it might make it even a more continuous thing. But when people think, firm your jaw up, people, maybe it's not the whole thing. Maybe it's part of it. So this might sound complex if you're not, used to just shrinking yourself back into the principle and finding what's needed. So we get into all sorts of things, which we're going to get into on Frequency Bone Sermon Music Connection 16, Zoom Session 7, which is this Thursday, um, sometime in July. <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head. Let me take a quick look here. I think it's July, um, yeah, July 18th. July 18th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So we'll put a link where people can go and to the blog and find out what to do if they want to hear it or be a part of that session should be very interesting. We're going to get into the different aspect of creativity and maybe even look at some of the Bolter embouchure anatomy and then go into where some of the blockages of creativity happen, mental, emotionally, and physically, just a bit to see. And one of the biggest stoppers of creativity is fear. The fear of the unknown. The fear of doing something wrong. But we'll get into that a bit. Hope this is useful. Hope to see you Thursday.